Welcome to the New Villa podcast and I'm um, Sean, uh, Duve Sean, the host. Today I do have a special person. I, I can't say I've hunted him for a while, but the name has always popped up on my radar of the different circles and I've been following the journey for quite a long time. Uh, just see, Andre, welcome. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for inviting me to the Novella podcast. I'm glad to be here. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Saturday, the day to relax. So, yeah, just trying to do that exactly. Yeah, sure. And then I happen to get you on my schedule when you're supposed to relax. To do. Well, probably you, you, are, you are trying to get that rest having put out the album which we'll talk about later on yeah. uh, on the podcast. So uh to, to those who do not know Jesse, who who is Jesse Bionjo? Man, I'm, I'm just a creative. I'm just a musician, music producer, visual artist. And that's the best way I can describe myself. Of course, when you look at those different facets of my life, that's, that's when you can begin to break down exactly what I'm interested in or what my principles are or what my outlook on life is. But that is what you really start with. I'm a creative. Nice, nice. Um, there are two songs in your dis- discography that I feel personally, they mm. give an idea of, of who you are without without you actually uh, saying so. And uh, I think one, mm. one of the songs is, um, I, I could, actually one of them is an intro, okay? One is mm. an intro to, to your new album, Afrosphere. Afrosphere, mm. I'm saying it right? Yep, yep. Uh, one, one of the intro to that project and then, um, there is a song on your EP, the Chidandali EP. Mm. And I think the title track where you say they want me to sing this and that. I, I mm. feel that describe who you are. You don't want you're you're a creative who who does not want to be boxed. What what can mm. you say about that? Well, what I can say about that is. I believe there are no limits. When you begin creating limits of, or boundaries within which to create, you stop to discover. And I'm also an artist and I've studied great artists, people like Da Vinci or Michelangelo, and I teach about them as well. And when you see what their curiosity was able to help them achieve, and this was probably in the 16th or 17th century you know you start to realize that you need to be a person that is willing to discover new things over time in your domain uh, whether whether you're a musician or not you need to be the person who's curious enough to to push the boundaries and always be on the edge so when you exist in a society or environment that is trying to curtail that all the time that becomes frustrating. So that's what Chidandali comes about. And that's how it does have a new genres were born. New genres were born always at the edge of, of discovery. You know, they're never born uh, within the confines of what people considered safe or mainstream or what we should do. Of course, you don't ignore the zeitgeist, ideally the popular things or popular elements of the music, but at the edge, at the borders of it, that is where new genre always came about. So I'm thinking, I'm telling you I've stopped discovering. Of course, there's nothing new under the sun, but you always get from things that already existed. But the question would be, can't we ever create something new? Can't we? Interestingly, last yesterday night, I was supposed to have a radio interview, uh, next radio. Fortunately, we had the president speaking, so we postponed it. And I remember the top countdown had songs from Uganda from, I think, around 2009 10 you know and for some reason we kept on saying this was like almost the golden age of, of urban music because that's the time when songs have been really really in heavy rotation with uh, also a producer like just jose 
and all these songs, even Rubber Dabba at that time, very, very seriously racist. And they're like, how come we don't have that now? And how come we didn't evolve from that and actually get better? For some reason, there was some regression in music. So it makes you realize that it has to be the artists who are intentionally go out and be like, okay, this is whatever it's creating. I'm going to create this because it's important that we're always at the, at the edge of it. And when we're looking back and looking at 2009, 2010, and that's when Swang's Avenue, the songs like Mr. DJ were out in 2008, 2009. Navi was really popping at that point. You know, like the music was very interesting then. Hip hop in particular as well was very interesting then. But you look now and you're like, wait a minute, something isn't adding up. And you notice it is not uh, a given that music will develop or become better. A time can come when people will be like, you know, this is what we're creating and we're going to stay in this confines. So it has to be the artists who intentionally uh, go out of their way, not to, to align or to conform, but to experiment, to collaborate, you know. In those, in those spaces is where you're going to find something new. That's where something new will be born. And that is why uh, I created Chidan Dali and that's really my mindset in general. Journey. Okay, so the journey I began making music. I've been, okay, the journey really started in church. Uh, I would say church. Uh, what total, I remember joining a certain group called uh, um, City Lights, I've probably been S2. I was trained there. Uh, I remember we used to do vocal lessons, uh, dance lessons as well. Church is really a place for many musicians, uh, Ugandan and abroad. Many of us are, are bred in church. And so eventually, I also joined another <coughs> band called World Springs, that's All Saints, which is just uh, on top of the hill next to Watoto. And for me, I really created good friendships there and good bonds. And uh, eventually, I learned to play guitar in Essex Park. And by the time I was still in the band, then at campus, that's when I began to double a bit in, in music production, but not so much <clears throat> music production to just creating the uh, melodies here and there. Then I went to studio when I was in second year. That's when I released my first song. I was in 2012, I think. Yeah, 2012. So I released my first song. It was on radio at that point. Uh, then I began to collaborate a lot. I think the people who brought me to the fold mainly were uh, hip hop musicians. Yeah, of course, Rionga was like the first person I collaborated with. But even before I released that music, I remember I was a backup singer for Maurice's career's uh, concert, his real first concert. But when it came to mainstream music or radio music, it was really hip hop musician that brought me to the fall, the younger, the myth. Uh, um, oh, who else? Yeah, younger myth. I also did some work with the song with GNL. Uh, trying to remember the other rapper that I collaborated with, Enigma. Uh, so those are like the main people that really brought me to the fall because they're really popular at that point. Yeah, and ever since then, Jesse Miojo has been a musician, releasing music, collaborating. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So um, you do have uh, three full-length projects out. That is uh, Chitandali and um, the new project Afrosphere and our project. That if we try. We actually four because I did uh, I released one last year as well. But the three, it was a conceptual more. Uh, it was a uh, it was a conscious album, a conscious EP rather of three songs. But I released it yeah, separately. Mm. 
all these projects say something about what 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 you are at, the level you are at. Mm. Okay, so the, the first, okay, the really so first one is uh, if we try. And if we try was was really more uh, more project that was uh, concentrating and highlighting my ability as a singer and songwriter and also guitarist because those were like my principal skills at that time. The things that you say, hey, JC, you perform on spot. That's what I could do. And obviously, it is also not a single. It's not a single theme song. I, I mean, a, a single theme the album because I don't like to create single themes that are that long. You know, you can't break you can't break them down uh, in many ways if you want. But I feel like I need to talk about different things because yeah, I'm always like to, uh, thinking about different things at the same same time as well. So if we try, it was really more of something that was highlighting me as a singer songwriter. Then uh, Chidandali was like my real first project as a producer. Yeah, but it was a solo project in a sense. I only collaborated with two musicians on that one. But it was more of my first uh, project as a producer. And I was uh, experimenting, getting better. And yeah, again, it's also different, different aspects in life that I was uh, highlighting. Um, now that you've said you've actually been, you know, uh, trying to to do the production as well, and then uh, the artist singer, some somewhere you do some like some bars there, you you rap sing somewhere there, and 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 I would like to just comment comment the work on um, the Chidandali title track because I noticed. It's Thank you. Multi genre from yes, one yes. point to another. You move from, and, and the, the time when I was listening to it and I noticed, oh, that is trap. I'm like, yeah. okay, how did we get there? So I have to, to mm. like, the, this, I, I play back songs so that I track down every, every single, I, I, should, I think, instrument and sound. I, I noticed mm. you telling me, okay. You are against Chidandali, but Loki, this is some hybrid Chidandali. I don't know if that was the yes. intention. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Actually, the, the the reason why I met Chidandali is in, if you if you go and Google Chidandali and see what Wikipedia brings, Chidandali will be described differently from what we understand Chidandali as. And Chidandali is really seen as in a negative view here. But I wanted to get the positive things in Chidandali and address the culture that people have, the mindset that people have. So I got the positive things, the positive elements of Chidandali, because Chidandali is really, if you want you to Google it, you'll find out what Wikipedia says about Chidandali, the different genres that make Chidandali. Chidandali is not bad inherently when you look at the music that inspired it, but the things that Ugandans have, have uh, been able, I mean, uh, the, the cast yeah, that Ugandans have, of uh, when you make a cast and you pour wax in it, yeah, and you get that mold that you get stuck in, the ones that you can't update themselves get stuck in, it's just disappointing, especially producers and musicians, yeah, because it's, it's it, it, at the forefront, we're not seeing people who are, are doing uh, exciting, creative uh, things. When you look at Nigeria, that is happening because there's mad serious competition in Nigeria in the music industry. And every two years, there is an interesting crop of musicians that comes up because of their competition and their willingness to be at the edge of it. It's impossible to find, it's, it's hard to find that in UG. Okay, it's possible you can find it, but it's really not at the, at the, at the mainstream level. It's more of the niche musicians, or not niche, I mean uh, more of the indie artists that are doing that or contemporary artists that are doing that but the ones that have the huge platforms that aren't doing that you know and so that's what i did with shidandali i got facets or elements that i like about the music and i was addressing the mindset the negative mindset so it was like 
two things at the same time like yeah that's what i was doing with that, that particular song and if you listen to the rest of the songs as well i also get elements of chidandale that i like and i use them to produce uh, music that i like by using chidandale elements i feel like i feel like you were trying to say okay this could be the sound of the Uganda music i feel like that is what you were trying to say but you missed the point by looking at the Like that is what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, when it comes to the Sonics, I felt Uganda could do better. That was the whole point of the project. Uh, I know many people were only looking at what I was addressing, but of course, anyone who listens to music and they're not only listening to lyrics, because music you're consuming it really awesomely. You're going to enjoy the music. Like, oh, I like what you're saying, but I like the music as well. I know I agree with what you're saying, but I like the sound that you've created it with. And that is really the, the point at the end of the day. And music production is so important. I feel like, because uh, uh, music producers really do influence the soundscape, they change the paradigm. Like the time when Washington was producing for radio and music, yeah, and he had the music industry, or I should say the sound, in his pumps. Really. And I think it's important for music producers to realize how much power they may have. You know, right now we're seeing Daddy Andre is a person who is doing that, especially producer artists. You know, uh, at one point uh, it was just Jose when he was with Swan Seven. So you influence a whole uh, generation, or you you can shift the paradigms just be, by being a music producer. And th- that's the thing that I'm really diving into more. Right. Uh, okay. Speaking of producers, um, who, whose sound do you feel? Yeah, this this sound appeals to me. In Uganda or generally? Let's start with Uganda. Uganda. Hmm. It's a good question. Very good question. Hmm. In Uganda, I'm going to start with a guy called Sam Bisaso. Sam Bisaso is so much of a live musician, though. Sam Bisaso produced Maurice Kriya's first uh, album. He was part of the producers, even in the second one, I think. He's a bass guitarist. I like it when uh, sound, pro- I mean, music producers are instrumentalists as well, because understanding music theory is important. You can expand, you can expand rather your world by just understanding music theory. So Sam Bisaso, then there's also Kas Kasozi. Kas Kasozi has produced for Sandra Nakoma, uh, uh, Kadugala album, which was like it won an Afrima award. It was a very, very good album. The Sonics were amazing. If you play that album in a car, man, <laughs> yeah, it just sounds so good. The instruments, the clarity. Uh, so Sam Bisaso, Kas Kasozi, now when it comes to hip hop producers, I would say Ethan, yeah. Ethan is a very good producer. I like his selection. I like the selection of instruments. Yeah. I like the song he did with uh, Taka HD and uh, Keiko Mudala. I think it's a very, very good song. Yeah. Uh, trying to find another producer. Nelson Mohire is also one of the people that trained me. Uh, the guy that is uh, behind Collective UG. Uh, the, the guy that did Amen. Uh, then Abasa. Abasa is a close friend of mine and actually my longest collaborator. I like his melodies. I like his uh, vocal production. I work with him closely. I work with him on every project that I've worked on. So for me, those those are serious producers. They're not joking around. And yeah, that is it. Nice. Um, I mean, uh, with all the names you have mentioned, I, I, I excited. I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, Abbas' work. I haven't seen uh, him mm. listen to their projects. I think they're amazing uh, projects and their sound, but mm. uh, is though, though I expect to, to say maybe Baru, I don't know. Oh yeah, Barrow definitely. Barrow was no Barrow is also 
uh, very specialized, but he's expanding his world recently because I've been in studio with him and worked on certain projects with him. So yes, Baru also, uh, yeah, definitely Baru because, and Baru also is definitely a close collaborator of uh, Avasa. And what I like about Baru is his consistency. Uh, yeah, I was trying to look for the names, the names are skipping uh, out of my mind. Yeah, but Baru definitely, because he's also very consistent and very hardworking and he's focused. And I like that uh, outside even just the studio. So yes, Baru, <laughs> definitely. Because he actually mastered uh, my, my last uh, project. And you, I think you were about to tell us about uh, the producers out of Uganda that appeal to you, that we can move to the next thing. Oh yeah, uh, I love hip hop producers, but uh, I'm going to mention mainly R&B, pop, then hip hop. So R&B, I like uh, Back the Bay, Dark Child, <laughs> really amazing producer. I also like before him, obviously, Babyface, because Babyface was just everything from writer, producer, singer. Amazing. Uh, well, it's Dark Child, Babyface, Dark Child, uh, JD. Uh, um, these are all the older producers. Then we come closer to people like Sonwave. Sonwave, Sonwave is an amazing producer, uh, Kendrick Lamar and uh, Top Dog Entertainment. Um, I'm trying to find another R&B producer that I can. I think even Music Soul Child is a producer. Yes. So, a, so I keep on mentioning producer artists. Producer. Obviously, uh, yes. Pharrell. Mm, who else? Yeah, yeah. Timbaland, man. Yes, definitely. Timbaland, Pharrell. Uh, who else? Then it comes to pop music because there are many, man. I can mention forever. I'm just let me shift on. When it comes to pop, I like um, Max Martin. Max Martin is is a beast. He's like is another level already. Max Martin. Uh, then how can I forget uh, Quincy Jones? Quincy Jones, I think for me, tops it up all. Yeah, for all of them, Quincy Jones is like the epitome. And obviously, Dr. Dre, but Quincy Jones tops it up for me. I think I, for, for rap's sake, because mm. uh, some people True. say Dre is actually a student of Quincy. Yeah, I've had, I've had the, the conversation. Dr. Dre has said that himself as well. Like, how is it mm. being behind the boat and then being the, the artist in front in front of uh, the people? How is it like? What's the feeling? Mm, I think the production is really like my latest thing as an artist. People have not are now started to experience this they're opening their minds up to me being a producer so the reactions are still new because she, uh, when i released she done people wasn't weren't really talking about my production so much they like the songs but i don't think in their minds jesse had it had yet uh made sense that i was a producer because i would keep on thinking oh you you produce a song as well like yeah i did it oh you even did the vocals as well like yeah i did that so it was more of uh the, the the fact was just settling. Now on this new album, they're like, "Oh man, Jesse, the sound, Jesse, the sound." So I like that reaction. But while well, as a performer, I've been doing that for so long, really. Uh, the reactions are the same. You're a performer. It's it's, it's really not new to me. Uh, I've been doing that for a while. Jesse can go my ass, yes. That's when I'm like. He's actually producing every project ever since uh, she done that. Mm. Yeah. What's True. the reaction? How do you feel like you can uh, you can get the, the spotlight being the person creating the sound? Because a producer is actually playing a big role. The contributors. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
how much does you were sick feel like you, you were mm. sick of rappers hot or mentality yeah, yeah, true. No yeah, man, right, you're right, you're right on the spot. Uh, it feels good, man. It really does because for me, it is a mark of evolution. I believe in evolving all the time. You evolve or you die in any part of your life. You either evolve or you die. Like do it to the end. And again, I'm a student of guys like Da Vinci, who was a universalist, who was an architect, an engineer, a musician, a painter. These uh, Renaissance men didn't believe in limitations. And this is hundreds of years ago. So, uh, so for me, the, uh, the ability to show that I've evolved and for people to understand that and see that really does feel good. Yeah, it really does. I'm always, always waiting for the next challenge like okay i've done this what's next i'm already moving on to the next one as well um, so let, let's jump into the new album um, mm. yeah yeah afrosphere so the word comes from being afrocentric and also what was in my atmosphere at that time in terms of what I'm listening to. The world has, uh, has had an interesting shift. Uh, has had an interesting shift when it comes to Afrobeats yeah, and Afropop. We have seen them adopt and adapt as well. Adopt it and adapt to it. Uh, we've seen how I think it really properly started with uh, Kanye West. I, I can't even believe I forgot to mention Kanye West as a producer because he's <laughs> like the biggest influence actually yeah Kanye West. so it really started with Kanye West and uh when he collaborated with the nigerian what's his name don jazzy and uh forgetting the other the rapper oliver twist yeah that's when we began seeing a proper shift you know of uh, american music starting to pay attention to afro beats you know and man, that was really interesting. That was really, really good. Because Kanye West always did it before everyone else. And Drake, of course, followed after that. And when we saw that shift, that song of Oliver Twist, and how those guys were brought into the fold, how Don Jazzy came into the fold to produce on uh, Watch the Throne, then you start to see a real shift later on with Jay-Z. Then also saw it, uh, this girl, this lady who was part of uh, uh, 50 Cent group, I'm forgetting her name, when she collaborated with this guy from, from Olivia. Congo. Olivia, when she collaborated with this guy from Congo, I'm forgetting his name, when they did that song that had a Lingala feel to it. Then eventually you start to see that the world is paying attention to Afrocentric, I mean, I mean Afrobeats rather. Then I, however, have been influenced a lot by hip hop and R&B. Like you mentioned, I'm a musician with a rapper's heart. I listen to hip hop a lot. I love rap music. I can rap if I want to. If I say, Jesse, let's go rap, I will do that. But I'm like, you know, what? Uh, I don't want to delve so much into it right now. So I decided to combine the things that I that influenced me and the things that are currently influencing the, 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 the zeitgeist, really, of the popular world music. I've seen Justin Bieber just appear on a Whiskey song. Like, you really now to start to notice that African music and African production can't be ignored. So I got the elements from Afropop and Afrobeats and combine it with the things that I love from the very get go, from the start, from the onset, and that is hip hop and R&B. And that is why you have mainly hip hop musicians on the album, mainly. Uh, and the R&B aspect has me singing or Lamu. Uh, yeah, so that is what it really was about. And that's how Afrosphere, the name Afrosphere comes about. The, the album is an African atmosphere. I, I find I find that you know you, you made it so so brief that I still wanted to explore. <laughs> I don't know if the yeah. intention the intention is uh, maybe in the streaming age, which you can talk about. But like mm. I, I had it in and I said, you know what? Let me do some some. Uh, uh, let me listen to the project uh, once. Uh, you know, the first time when it drops uh, the other weekend. So I didn't, mm. I didn't bother. Look, 
right how long it is you know all those details normally i like to listen to the music i don't even want to see the titles when it's a mm. project just want to plug in and then mm. listen to whatever i do mm. all of a sudden the project is done and i'm like Mm-hmm. Why is mm-hmm. the same thing Paro does with his series of EPs? Mm-hmm. I don't know what you say about the length. Yeah, uh, I think I was actually, I had like probably two more songs I was going to add to it, but I felt what needed to be said and what would fit properly in the Sonics of the album cohesively was enough. Uh, and again, generally people have a shorter attention span these days, to be honest. And the importance for them to fully get what you're trying for them to listen to because you know i didn't release a single i released it as a project and i wanted people to listen to it as a project yes eventually i want to push particular songs individually but i wanted them to understand the importance of listening to a project throughout uh, and getting the picture that you're trying to paint rather than releasing one single and pushing a 16 track album and having some songs to never listen to so and it's also good to be able to fund this that way and give them a dose slowly eventually is big enough for them to consume they are ready to sit down and actually listen to it and that is why i've been releasing uh, uh, short uh, shorter albums or short eps really and also the reason was because you want to make sure that you have no monotony really at one point yes that's the you can tell one person produced it the sounds are are are, are tied in well together but you want to make sure you don't lose people so it's it's a, a balance really because a time comes yeah so that is why really that is why i release a short project eventually i'll release at most a 12 track album but I don't like really uh, having very lengthy albums. I don't see the point. Oh, you didn't want to be a Chris Brown and you release 40 songs as an album. <laughs> yeah, and I was just mentioning that. I don't want to be, and Chris Brown has obviously a strategic reason or point why he did that, because Chris mm-hmm. Brown is Chris Brown. All those songs will get him money eventually. But if you're not at that level, what, what are you, because the, the resources that you have to put into making these songs, then it's not free. Yes, I can yes. produce, but I, I worked with Abasa and Baru and chosen for free, you know, because these are my contemporaries and I respect their craft. I pay them to master, I pay them to mix. Some of the instrumentalists, uh, friends of mine will come and play. One of them, maybe you pay them because, you know, you don't have that type of connection. So, and you're not going to try and get stuff for free. Yeah, so it's, you have to amass resources. And for me, my resources are my skills, I've amassed skills over time. And I don't have to pay my way through everything. But if you're not doing that, you have to pay your way through everything. So who, how are you going to release a 12-track album unless you have a trust fund or a serious funding? And each song is going to cost you seriously and you don't even have the resources. That's madness. So you either gather the skills to be able to do these things and complement your creativity and pay when to pay, or you go get and this is the thing, being an independent artist, most independent artists are, are real do, do-it-yourself uh, types because you realize that's what being signed does for you. It gives you a budget and gives you uh, an advance to go and create, you know, but you have to pay that back. Not even the same amount of money, you have to pay back in profit. So it is, when you look at the back end of the creative process, that people don't even imagine like what an artist will go through to release all these songs, you know, it is it is proper sacrifice. Yeah, true. So, um, given a chance, uh, would you yeah. sign a deal? Given a chance, yeah. W- why not? It depends. It depends on uh, on the kind of deal, obviously. And the deals come to you. you know, they also want to see what leverage you have. If you have no bargaining power, man, if you can sign a deal. And for example, I'll give you an example. J. Cole, for instance, when J. Cole signed his first deal, he didn't sign a very good deal. You know, but he delivered and he delivered. Every time you deliver, you can always go back to the negotiating table and you renegotiate a better deal. And J. Cole never negotiated any deal until Forest Hill Drive, you know, until he sat down. It was uh, th- through a uh, sideline, sideline story. Then uh, Bonsina, 
he kept on delivering. He was always number one, but he never negotiated these deals until for a seal drive, that's when the deal was renegotiated. And now he had serious bargaining power. So if you're going to say signing a deal is evil, why do artists like J. Cole end up surviving? Because then, okay, it's uh, rare, but they exist. It depends on how much, how you use that money. Now, for instance, if I got a record deal, and obviously I would want to make sure that I can choose the producers I work with, or I can produce for myself, rather than them telling you who you have to work with. Because if they tell you who you have to work with, you have to pay that parcel. Things like that. So you have to know, I can sign it depending on the, the agreements that we have. But I have uh, a deal on the table, not out of the question. So if they gave me a deal and they're like, okay, we like what you've done, and that is why I want to sign you, meaning you like the sound I've created, meaning I have to produce for myself or I have to choose my production team. Uh, but if they're like, oh, you're a good singer, but we want to change your production and we're giving you a deal, you know, you start to see what leverage do you have. Yeah, so it depends really on the argument, but a deal is not off the table. All these artists were seeing have deals. Even when we look at Songs Avenue, uh, Irene Tele had a deal. Uh, this new girl with the Songs Avenue, Azawi has a deal, you know, but it depends on what they're getting out of it. Uh, and, and you've said it clearly, uh, depending on what they're getting out of it. I think most people sign deals without understanding them, probably because they are very young, or yeah, professional, yeah. They, as regards age. Oh, sometimes some people are actually too young to, to control the outcomes of the deal. Because the advance is exciting. Um, I think they... Independent route is also important for someone to at least first go solo or mm. independently for a, a, a certain period of time to understand uh, the dynamics of, of every aspect of the game. And probably either you have a deal where you, you of course, should take the majority stake, having you know invested in yourself for a long time. I think mm. me. For, for me, my advice would be that, you know, be independent. When a deal arises, have a partnership. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, that makes sense. It, must, it, it makes sense either distribution or something else. But independent, uh, people really like to <laughs> romanticize being independent. <laughs> Being Indian, I, I do, I know, and I know, I know the, the feeling. Mm. Go on. And and actually, even the word being independent is not even understood in Uganda because even deals alone are not understood or having yeah. record labels because the industry is not set up like that. So here in Uganda, people just have sponsors, you know, and those become your, and they many of them don't even understand how music works or how much you have to wait for to get your investment back, things like that. So being independent in UG, largely we're all independent. We're all independent, even when it comes to people like uh, someone as huge as, 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 as who, I don't mention names now, the huge artists that we're seeing right now in the mainstream, and they're being pushed, they have no record label, they have these managers here and there, they have booking agents, but they're mainly independent. The question would be who's funding them because money has to be spent regardless these music videos are free who's funding them and who are they partnering with so i think the conversation here we if you look at it from an american uh, uh, context it's very different from a ugandan context and i think when you talk about independent artists you should bring it down to the ugandan context because who's out there signing ugandan musicians no, no one's doing that so you're going to remain largely independent whether you like it or not so that whole conversation of if you get a deal, would you sign it? Who's giving you the deal? Is it Sony Africa? You know, if they're going to give you a deal, you have to be as huge as Keko, and on top of that, they're going to bury you as well. Anyway. So it's 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 funny, yeah. Like that conversation of would you get a if you get a deal, did you sign it? You'd have to ask me that conversation because abroad here, it's a whole different conversation, man. We are independent. We are. Uh, I think I think 98% of uh, the industry is actually independent. 98. Yeah, because um, but I listened to Cindy sometimes. She said she she just works with teams. Uh, Gravity said he controls every aspect <laughs> of his career. 
from the financing to the debt to you know the events and all that. Um, I think revenue mm. uh, probably is the, the only legitimate, if I should use the word, the only recognized level as such. There are those that have been there before. Um, yeah. We used to have platinum, uh, Shadra, mm. Shadra yeah. Bona, I think uh, he put, uh, I think he revamped into buying entertainment group, something of that nature. Mm. So I don't know. Mm. Ironic, it's operating as a fully uh, fledged uh, record label. The reason why I brought mm. this conversation is that when I read the credits below on, on the EP, I see uh, Lobster right there. You know? mm. And then when I look at the previous work, uh, mm. the, the, the copyrights were to sketch clan, something mm. like that. I yeah. hope you don't say this, this for me. I've done some sort of police investigation kind of thing, but I, okay. I have to research. You have, you have done your investigation. I, I, I appreciate I respect that. So yes, Cash Clan is a company that we built, me and a friend of mine, a multimedia company, especially dealing with music and uh, animation. And we bought the equipment that does the music production and also the equipment is also, and of course a skill that we have helping the, when we create, when we have animation projects. Uh, Lobster does not have credit to the music. I have the rights to the music because I made it. He's distributing through Orchard. Yeah, and takes a percentage uh, as a distributor, but the copyright remains mine. All the music is mine. Oh, yeah. So um, apparently, is actually is 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 only distributing because I've seen him. Uh, I've I've seen the name on other projects. I think from Baru. I've yeah. seen uh, online on and yeah, yeah, yeah. looks like a cool guy because he really understands also the back end of it because he's invested his time to understand how these things work as well. He has good contacts either in Nigeria or Kenya. And he's a, you want to have that mind around you when it comes to pushing the music as well. So I decided to work with him, uh, especially on this one, and see what is the difference between the previous ones and this one. Of course, you're going to do your comparisons. And obviously, you can't do everything by yourself. No, no, one, is smarter. no one is smarter than all of us in the room. Yeah. And yeah, I'm seeing the good results as well, especially online reactions. But for me, uh, there's certain things that I don't buy into easily uh, recently, something like uh, vanity match- metrics, really. <clears throat> because at the end of the day, if you want, to, you want to make your investment back, you have to be on stage performing. And you also Most want to sell much and you have to be you have to sell merchandise. And stage is something that I've been doing since I was very young. And that is where I really trust my ability as well. I may be a producer, but performing is not something that I've been a performer longer than I've been a producer. So eventually those numbers have to convert into tickets or people coming to your shows or people buying your merchandise. And that's what's more important for me because that money goes back into creating. You don't just throw money at something and not expected to pay you back so for example in 2019 i held three shows about three shows and that time i was not pushing a lot of my music online people knew me yes their music was on radio and whatever but the fact that we never made any loss from the get we did three shows people came through and i never put in any amount of money at the start all the money that we got we got from the get collection and able to pay everyone from the music program, I mean for the instrumentalists, to me, myself, to the photographers, the venue had its own cut, Vivian took the bar. At the end of the day, it showed me the importance of making sure that you drive your numbers to, to that, to perform, yeah, do shows, do events, uh, rather than just staying online. I, I'm not, I, I don't buy into that so much. Yes, I like the streams. Like seeing the numbers, the streams don't pay you that much. A thousand streams are a thousand streams really on Spotify are like 50, like how much? It's 15 uh, dollars. You know the, mm. you know the gospel I've been trying to preach out there mm. is uh, 
is this for access to okay the streaming is cool it helps you tap into maybe a newer audience but i, I, I was thinking about if you sold the music directly on, on your website because when you go like on live i i do have a store there uh, mm. I'm, i i'm a poet but i, I you know for those who know me and want to start mm. i just the link i don't have to yeah. send them the link so one purchase is enough for me to to gonna like a hundred streams because yeah, the streaming right. it's the streaming for a, a, a person with a niche kind of audience it's really a lot of work yes yes have, thank you very much yes if you have a platform that you you run and own by yourself you know you can't my new I believe I believe that 100% and that's just, that's something that I want to delve into properly because you start to notice wait a minute the streaming at one point only makes sense when you're really 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 huge you know and you're probably getting like 10,000 streams per song monthly that's when you can say yeah streaming works uh so for now you you start to test and see how different uh different spaces work and then you come back to your drawing board you're like okay it's better this way i've gathered a huge number of funds i have a website and i have a payment platform that people can buy my music directly those who want to stream can go stream but those True. that really want if if you got 100 people if you got 100 people giving you uh 20,000 shillings you know my friend getting it from streaming eh? <laughs> yeah, you have I, to have way more than 100 people to get just just, money. Just, just to cut you short. I recently actually put out an article on on uh, having two fans. You only need 100 people to, you know, to survive. Mm. Each of them is giving mm. you 20,000 per month, mm. you know, for to purchase the music. Just yeah. those 100 about uh, 2 million at least you can do something out of oh, yeah. to survive. Yeah, you know, without no, you're right. And then these other platforms and then we can add on those other platforms and the merchandise. I think it would be a cool thing. Streaming yes, is Yes, man. <laughs> you're you're right. You're right. You're very right. Yeah, the streaming the streaming the streaming is it's actually the reason why I even shifted from my previous distributor to Lobster because at least at working with Orchard because Lobster is an Orchard agent is because the numbers even are better you know when you're on the other streaming platforms you're paying a yearly fee yes, but it's really all up to you you know you don't even have a direct contact It's like you're talking to a bot you know then you realize wait a minute they have been played here you know you're paying these niggas more than you're getting out of it so yeah. hence the shift to working with with Lobster. and i'm seeing the results in a certain sense when it comes to the matrix the numbers the music is there moving while well, previously chidandali was known to so more known on radio airplay of which they didn't even pay us as well yeah so you start to see you start to really break down when it comes to music business yeah now that's the difference between creating music and music business when you start to realize what am i really what tangible things am i getting out of the work that i'm putting into this and i i really am a big believer in that moving to the direction of having people directly pay to you because i've had people who have directly bought my music this previous album they're calling me and directly buying you know and they're sending me money you know and it it shows that you can build that group of people that are willing to do that so yes the next project the next project that we work on is definitely that you will be uh in mind and every project that comes on after that i remember uh this guy uh what's his name I've forgotten his name he 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 released uh, his album as an nft tori lens and he has over 10 million followers and i think he sold each i know it didn't sell uh, you could get that album uh at like i think one dollar and i think in two minutes is it one dollar because people would buy that music and resell it as nfts if they wanted because you own a part of it he had gone over gold a gold record amount of sales in 2 minutes i think just because you went that route of an nft and it shows you if you build a proper fund base and you consolidate your fund base and you're able to get them to buy your product directly 
that is better than uh, relying on the middleman, the streaming app, to get tangible money. You rather put your efforts in that. And for me, that's the direction I want to take. Because again, we're independent, right? So yes, I believe in that. I, I, I like the direction. Uh, probably uh, we can always come back some other time, you know, to discuss, you know, the music mm. uh, business. Mm. Uh, and I and I like that you are actually following every every step of you know the trends that can be set. I, I used to think streaming was everything until you know I did mm. a couple contribution for a number of people like they mm. get numbers but really when you look at the check it's not worth it so it, it's yeah. so you can't put the middle uh, I've seen yes. um, I've seen independent artists ab- abroad doing the same thing uh, people like Ryan Lynn was the industry yes, yes. Was holding so yes, yeah, yes. I think it's a good thing yeah no no I believe in that actually I'm more excited about the next project because now this one is slightly harder because you have so many people that you've collaborated with and they have split sheets and percentages and because I did all that as well and people are entitled to their their uh, intellectual property yeah but now the next one will is not going to be so much of a collaborative if I, it is it will be very few musicians probably three or four at most and I would prefer really more of Jesse music uh, and so I'm going to split the artist and the producer so here this is like the the, 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 the project that merged the two so well or at least has started to do that because I want to do more after three albums eventually not only this but with time I want to step away from being the person who's singing and be the person who produces more but I will continue as an artist as a singer songwriter uh, just the same way we've seen uh, One Republic Well, the guy, the lead singer of One Republic is a producer and he has worked with Timbaland, uh, Timber, like, Timbaland rather. He, he, he has worked with Timbaland to produce R&B and whatever, but you can never tell that because he split those two, the artist and the producer. And when you keep on mixing them all the time, the artist and producer, one of them might suffer, the artist may suffer. So that's why I don't want to overly delve into appearing on projects which are so out of the the genre that I am known for as an artist because really I'm a singer and guitarist so I want to split those two and continue on that path as a producer but also the path as a singer guitarist which I really love as well and that is the one that I'm really going to focus so much on that your super fun uh, concept nice um, mm. So actually don't own the super fun concept. I, I read somewhere, my, the founder of The Wire, he, mm. he broke it down to a thousand. So I broke it down for my Ugandan uh, people. 200. Mm. To, to 200. It makes, it makes quite some good sense. Uh, so mm. uh, probably in, in, in the future, you can hit me up and uh, we can mm. have conversations, you know, of cutting out the meat. Oh. No, definitely, man. I like your mindset. I remember one thing was that made me really agree to the podcast is I remember you giving out some advice and watching the video on artists and how they should uh, navigate when it comes to emailing uh, particular people. It really shows that you do your research. Yeah, you do your research work and I, I appreciate people that do that so much. And I'm definitely going to keep in contact. And yeah, I would like to have that conversation better. I want to see what you've done, how you've done it. And I will move in that direction as well. Uh, I used to think no one pays attention. That is proof people listen to the podcast, they see everything. Mm. Yeah, I know. To you, Jesse. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so probably any, Thank you very any, much. Yeah, any, any final remarks where people can get the music? Uh, yeah, the music. <laughs> yeah, the music was on every platform. As long as you type Jesse, Jay. Dot Cine, Andrew, you'll find it. Uh, and yes, this stream because yeah you need to benefit from it as well and yeah look out for more music for me i feel like i've just started i really feel like i've just started i'm re-energized that way uh, i like challenges and you're going to see me for a long time as long as god allows me to exist i'm going nowhere 
sure. And I also encourage people, if you want the album of Rospia and any other project you have released before, hit him up directly on uh, social media and, and let the man get the check directly. Okay, yeah, thank you, sir. Streaming, yes, we can benefit from it, but if you can't support directly, no problem. Yeah. It, it, um, it does wonders for the artist. Yes, it does. Um, it does. Unless there is any anything else you would like to say, uh, no, not really. That's that's really it. It's been a pleasure having you on here, Jesse. Um, thank you. Thank you. Glad that we've had this conversation. Uh, mm-hmm. Your name has popped up, but I didn't get in the special uh, time, you know, to to, to have the, the meeting. But I've been following the, the journey. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. I uh, appreciate that. And yeah, this has been a very interesting uh, conversation. Sure. Looking forward to more of these conversations. Uh, Definitely. I've been a new version for the Move Alive podcast, and we are to see you in the yep. next one. Peace, right. man.